great point to maybe deviate into a topic that uh, I didn't have on my list, but uh, you know, uh, what's what's the motivation? What what is your individual motivations within um, uh, being known as abstract artists or continuing a practice that has maybe that degree of competition? You know, I don't think about it. Uh, again, I feel stuck with myself, and uh, I want to look back at any given point uh, with as few regrets of things I've done and not done as possible. So I'm trying to stay on that track, and I made a, a decision in in uh, my life a long time ago, probably 45 years ago that I was more interested in things that came out of my head than things that came from direct observation. But how do things get in your head without trying to make sense of the world in which we're living? And uh, so it took me a long time to finally realize that what my search has been has been a focus on trying to resolve the dichotomy that I feel in my head between biomorphic shapes and geometric shapes, geometric forms. So it that that's sort of been the underlying thing for me. And it's right for me. I don't know that it's right for anybody else. Uh, but this search just continues and it, it's not a destination. It's more of a search, a trip. And I don't mean a trip like a drug trip. <laughs> I've never smoked pot before, so I don't know anything about it. Anyway. Um, but it has been a really interesting sort of uh, uh, continuation of, uh, of, of working away. And uh, I think the thing that stopped me from being involved in art sooner than I did make the commitment to, to toward was I thought that I would run out of ideas. And I still worry about that. Uh, however, it doesn't take long to set aside those fears once I'm rolling again in the studio. And that all sort of you know falls by the wayside. Uh, all through the time I was going through public school, I was uh, on the fringe of things. I thought of myself as a fringy. There is such a thing. And um, I'm still probably in that category. Um, I was doing, uh, I always seem to be connected with things that are not connected with other stuff that's going on. And I've come to uh, accept that. You know, I don't worry about it anymore. Uh, and uh, I think that, that uh, again, it's so important for each of us, if not all of us, whether we're involved in art or not, to come to grips with self-acceptance of what really is meaningful to us. So that's what I'm, you know, trying to do. Sure. Bruce, how about you? I, one of the things that I um, find to be interesting about the evolution of your career in, in recent times is this um, sort of embracing, I think, of um, maybe a slightly wider, maybe a much wider um, experiential frame within your practice. Um, for instance, our last exhibition here being very experimental, you're tied in with the experimental studies at the REMCAD, you know, um, how, how much is that affecting your work and your motivation? Uh, um, I suppose I would start by saying I don't consider myself an abstract artist. Or I don't think consider that to be a useful way to um, think about what I do. Because um, to me, it's all abstract. I mean, the air in this room is an abstraction. Um, and I think that, um, you know, to have that kind of widening out, and certainly, um, uh, you know, I think
think that, that there's a, a logic that abstraction as a category, um, historically speaking, has, uh, at least for me, quite radically changed in a, a contemporary sense. So abstraction, or one story of abstraction is, is that it is a um, reductive process. And so you go from the, um, the specificness of things to the generalness of things in order to come to a universal truth about things. I'm more interested now in um, an additive abstraction um, where it's about um, creating or gathering forces, and those are both material forces and conceptual forces um, that come together um, to make something that I didn't know I knew how to make. So I'm always trying to find something other than what I imagine I either should make or want to make, or I'm always trying to get past what I think is some notion of truth to get to something new. And I think that's very relevant in the age we live in because, as you all know, we have many, many rapid changes and challenges and we have to find new ways to be in the world, rather than trying to find some notion of, well, this is the truth, and this is the way to whatever it is. Um, so I'm always interested in being in opposition to. So I will make the claim that I am not an abstract artist, or it's not meaningful to say that I'm an abstract artist, because all art is abstract. I, I agree with you. Um, I, I think that <clears throat> it's very hard to find the distinction between, a bit, because everything is abstract, you know, in, in art, in terms of art and music and, and film. And, uh, so in terms of how things are categorized, what's deemed abstract and what's not, there's there's no fine line there, you know. And I, and, and well, for me, the owner, but, the, the reason I the reason I deal with abstraction is because I've just always had this I'm a very I'm a very cynical person and for me painting something that's representational is making a statement and I don't feel comfortable about that just because you know as as I get older it's I look back at what I've done in my life it's the same reason I've never gotten a tattoo because I'll get tired of it you know and if I make a statement a static statement in a painting. I know I'm going to hate that eventually. So for me, it's just a way of dealing with, you know, trying to find something that is beautiful for me, but in a way that isn't making a definitive statement. That's why I do an abstract art. But I also don't call myself, I wouldn't call myself an abstract artist because I do work in other areas. I mean, you've been to my studio. Um, my studio is a lot of representational stuff, but it's all about breaking down. It's all about breaking down. And then when I work on my paintings, it's all automatic. So I'm developing it as I go along because for me, the process of making art is more about discovering than it is saying something. Putting something out there that this is me or this is what I feel. It's more about who am I? Where am I going? And I think uh, you know, to refer to Dave talking about being on the fringes, I think most artists start out that way, or have always been a little on the fringe. And I yeah. think doing art is almost like therapy. You know, for a lot of artists, that's, you know, we don't really like to look at it that way, but it's, we're all a little weird, and we're, we're doing something that gives us some meaning, we're trying to find, <laughs> to <leave> you. <laughs> we're always trying to find beauty, and, and, some kind of uh, structure, in, in though we, sometimes we can be drawn to chaos. Within chaos, just as human beings, we want to create structure out of the chaos, and we want to find something that, that we can relate to, and we call that um, beauty. So it's... I, I really know that I think anyone who's 
have all screams about being different certainly isn't going to go in the direction of being an artist. So. That's true. Kate, do you want to add anything to the topic? <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. I would say that, that we all have lots of different reasons, motives for what we do and how, sure. how we construct um, a world that's either entirely internal that we then have to make external or taking it the opposite direction and using the external world to create an internal world that then becomes our work. There's lots of different ways to do it. I, I don't really look at my own practice of making art as cathartic. Um, I, I don't really want to, I don't really want to make it autobiographical. I really don't want to look back in five years and try to remember what kind of emotional mood or response or thought process I was really involved in at that time. I do feel like abstraction has a, a place in history. We do have a reading of it. it. We can look at things and kind of shape them in a way. There is sort of a, a, a sophisticated visual language that we understand now that was different in the 50s when Clifford Still was really um, beginning to get that palette knife out and, and make those good canvases. He, he had a completely different set of things around him that he was seeing and responding to. Um, than what we have now. I don't think those same paintings could be made now, actually. Uh, I mean, they could be technically made, but I'm not sure they could be sustained and made in that way if they were. Um, but I, I think we look at our own work. I can look back and all of us can. As artists, you can, you sort of move on. You make a, a set of work, it does its job, and next. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we're moving into something else now. And there is a reading of that abstraction. Abstraction to us now, like maybe from the 70s and 80s, maybe even some of the 90s, looks different than what we see right now. There is a definite progression, I hope. And, and I, I would <coughs> like for all artists to think that they have a real position in that, in that progression. I don't know where it's going. I don't know that anybody does. I don't want to know. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question? Well, oh, yes. yes. Uh, I, um, for, and I, I'm going to address this to Dave primarily, but Dave, don't you also feel maybe a more appropriate term to describe what you call a fringy is you're a free spirit? No, I, well, probably, but I'm not a fringy term. You know, I, I, uh, it, it was a not very interesting time here in high school. And uh, things got a lot better after that. But I've always been kind of on the outskirts of things. Movements in, in what's going on in art. And, uh, you know, do I care whether I am or not? A little bit, but not much. And so this, you know, this sort of thing just kind of continues. And, I, and I'm okay with that, comfortable with that at this point in my life. Um, I wanted to mention that there was something that happened to me. One of uh, somebody shared a book with me, and this was images, a book of images that were from some cave walls some 60,000 years ago uh, in France. And uh, there were these uh, images of animals sort of related probably to deer or elk or antelopes. And you can look at those and they're nicely drawn. But those weren't really interesting to me. What was interesting was an image that was of nine squares or rectangular shapes. And as far as I know, that's probably the first abstract image that human beings did. And I thought about that a lot. Where in the hell did that come from? Mm -hmm. You know, there were nearby Lowe's and Home Depot's with cinder blocks and four by eight sheets of plywood and two by fours and all of those building materials. Where did that come from? And that really fascinates me. And I think that was really the first of these uh, of abstract images that I've ever been aware of. And, you know, the, the, those sketches of animals on the cave walls really 
don't give me much to think about. I can recognize <coughs> those as that's what the those cave people were hunting to eat and clothe themselves and <coughs> that sort of thing, and you know, that's fine. But it was that that geometric image that really caught me. I keep thinking about that. Where did that come from? How what inspired that? So I really feel that abstraction wasn't something that some some outrageous people cooked up at the armory show or some other time. I think it's been it's been a part of of some part, maybe a small part of human culture for a very long time. And that really is interesting to me. Um, I can remember hearing Luis Jimenez speak at one point. He's a fellow that did the blue Mustang, <coughs> the red eyes, or DIA, or, yeah, DIA. And uh, he said, if you're an artist, you go back and you think about the things that you enjoyed as a child, what you grew up with, what you enjoyed doing, that's where your art comes from. Another artist, Terry Allen, said, if you're an artist, you're only interested in what you don't know and can't find out. That sounds a little bit more like what Bruce said. And said. And to me, that's really intriguing. But I think most artists are somewhere in that territory in, in between. You know, there is a question here that says that, um, which I happen to, well, I like because it's high low, but um, that abstraction actually comes out of the uh, tradition of orientation. That it happens in the same, initially, it happens in a kind of space that we're ends up in, the kind of space that orientation happens in. And at the same time that ornamentation comes off of architecture, it, it becomes autonomous in the uh, autonomous plane of the picture plane. Um, and so I think you can look at abstraction within the alternative history, because we rejected all that ornamentation stuff, inside um, ornamentation. But it has to, you know, I think you have to take ornamentation seriously rather than reject it as something. So radical. Beautiful. So radical. And so, you know, that painting out there of mine is um, based on two Islamic patterns, or excuse me, two uh, Middle Eastern patterns that I laid on top of each other and sampled a little piece about to make a kind of armature on the painting, which is a way for me of recognizing this history that I'm claiming as part of my artistic pantheon is ornamentation, um, which I did for a while. No, no. So three of the artists on this panel, and myself included, I am seeing that your work addressed it in this way, but it might still be interesting to you because you mentioned trying to converge straight lines with organic, you know, the, the, the biomorphic with the... It would, the would you have a not, yeah. not necessarily straight lines, but with, with geometry, Is geometric it, things. We're kind of, we sort of work with plaid a little bit mm -hmm. with the time. <laughs> Why do you think we're working with plaid? Well, I think it's funny to use plaid <laughs> rather than grid, because plaid is decorative. And so you're taking that kind of minimalist grid and you're decorating it. And to me, that's just funny. 